Hello everyone, this is Dominic from Tone Base, and I'm so excited today to have John Mortensen in the studio, well, in the virtual studio. He'll be talking a lot about improvisation, which is his forte, and uh, he'll be talking about a number of different aspects to it. We'll be really enjoying a, um, a video performance of his that was recorded. We'll um, be able to talk about perhaps exercises that you can take home and start working on to, to uh, try to master this, this really interesting and intricate craft. But as always, use the blue ask button to ask your questions so that we can share them with John and that we can put them on the screen. But uh, I'm, gonna bring, um, I'm gonna bring John in right now. So um, hello, John, welcome. Uh, we're so happy to have you today. And uh, you know, greetings, where are you coming to us from? Thank you, Dominic. I'm in Ohio, um, just in my studio at uh, the university where I work. Beautiful, beautiful. And so just to give a little bit of background for, for us, um, you are a tone based artist. You've taught on our platform. Mm -hmm. So some of us, uh, some of you guys may have seen your lessons, but can you give us a little um, general overview of what you've taught for tone base and, and perhaps why you, why you chose the topics that you, that you chose? Uh, I chose it because it's the only thing I'm any good at. Um, <laughs> but because uh, there's plenty of people on tone base who can handle all the usual stuff, you know, scales and arpeggios and literature and all of this and that. Um, so it's it's improvisation. Um, it's just very the the stuff on tone base is very introductory. Um, just the first few steps: what what partimento is, what rule of the octave is, and really everybody who wants to get into historical improvisation at the keyboard has to learn those basics. Uh, and and um, so, so that's that's really all it is. It's just kind of some rote stuff you have to memorize. Uh, so it's very labor intensive at the beginning. Um, it's like learning an alphabet in a new language that has a weird alphabet. Um, just just memorizing, repeating until it becomes fluent, and then from there you can start to construct things out of it. Great. And one of the questions that I have, you know, for you is. You're, you're a classical pianist, uh, it's trained mm -hmm. certainly. Um, uh, everyone, I, I, you can go on YouTube and you can watch a number of videos of John's. For example, I watched the other day his, his performance of Rachmaninoff's Prelude in B minor, and that's as good as it gets. I mean, I mean it's beautiful, virtuosic, uh, rich, lush playing. Uh, so, so, you know, you're a highly, highly trained, proficient pianist. And how did um, your transition go from perhaps just hmm. doing classical music to then incorporating the, the improvisation. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, I, I've been very happy as a classical pianist. I'm, I'm a professor and, I, you know, I teach piano majors, Bach preludes and fugues and Beethoven sonatas and Mozart and Brahms all day long. And, and that's still the majority of my job here. But a number of years ago, I just got a little bit restless about what I was going to play. And you know, I love the repertoire, and it will always be a central thing in my life. But just for me, the idea of going and learning another program, I, I just got stuck. Um, I, I just couldn't make myself want to go and just learn more programs and just keep doing that. I want other people to do it. I want to go to their concerts. I love that music. But I just, I wanted to do something else. And I started getting really interested in jazz and spent a couple of years just working on jazz proficiency. I'm not an excellent jazz pianist. I'm minimally competent. I know what's going on and, and I understand the mistakes I'm making. That's how I would describe my level of fluency. Uh, but in doing that and you know studying Monk and Jerome Kern and George Gershwin and, and all these people, Brubeck, I started to notice ways that what was happening in improvised jazz overlaps with what could be happening in classical music and started experimenting with this. What if the whole thing was not scripted in the score from the downbeat to the very end? What if there were things left open in classical music? What, what would happen? Would people throw rocks at you? Would they leave? Would they write a letter to the editor? You know, what would happen? Would they call the police? And so I started experimenting in concerts with this. And the first thing I would do, I would actually just play a couple of jazz numbers at the end and improvise on them. 
Uh, so just standards. Do you know what it means to miss New Orleans or um, Blue Monk or um, Well, You Needn't or st some standards like that? And then I thought, okay, what about, see, variations, like, like a set of variations by handle. That's a chord progression with a bunch of looping on it. And why does that have to be notated? If you had enough information about how to generate that material, you've already got the chord progression. That's just jazz, just playing over the changes. So I would play variation sets, and I wouldn't tell anybody in the audience, but I would insert improvised variations in the middle and just see if I could go home without you know, being attacked or criticized, you know, if I could get away with it. And so I was very shocked that I got away with it and nobody knew. And I said, what's the next step? Well, the next step is to, to tell them that some of these will be improvised and, and maybe play a game like, do you guys want to guess? You know, is it number three or is it number seven? And so I would do that and, and I got away with that. And then I said, okay, the next step is to improvise the entire thing. And I was very surprised, like it was completely doable. So I would use, the first thing I ever did was the uh, Handel Variations uh, G Major HWV 435, which is the opening eight bars of Goldberg. It's the same, exactly the same. Same thing. Uh, and, and I found out, oh, it's possible, you know, do triplets, do scales, do repeated notes, do dotted notes, blah, blah, blah. Uh, well, then from there, I could see on the horizon what about overtures? What about sonatas? What about, you know, preludes? What about all kinds of this other stuff? And that was what really sent me down this road, was just realizing that some of this was possible. So that's the very short version of how I got into it. Well, thank you for that. That's, that's really interesting. And just out of curiosity, um, so this would have been when you were a professor in Ohio that, that you mm -hmm. were having this, uh, I, I wouldn't say, uh, crisis, but this really, the, 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 this this intense interest in something new, something different mm -hmm. from from what you've been doing all your life, and, and that's really that's actually really inspiring because a lot of times we, we've had some other improvisers and, and jazz improvisers and um, pianists on tone bass, and a lot of them started you know very young in their you know maybe teenage years, and it can feel sometimes yeah. like we can't, you know, do that if, if it's too late. But, but, but you're saying that, you know, it, it is possible to get into this world at really any age, right? I, is, that, is that kind of what I'm hearing? I mean, piano yeah. playing, of course, <laughs> takes uh, some, some, so a little bit of, you know, of, of youth and practice and et cetera. Um, but, but the improvising part is your mental capacities were so, you know, finely tuned for that? Or? Um, well, the, the answer is yes, you can get into it later in life. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's everything is advantageous if you can start at an early age when you're a sponge and just soak it up. That's great. But once those years are passed, what are you not going to learn anything? That's right. uh, so I have a number of students. Uh, I think of one guy, he's a retired physician, and uh, he's been following my material for a number of years. And, you know, he, he plays well, um, was never a professional virtuoso, but just, you know, good hobbyist. And, um, He's quite remarkable, actually, in what he now improvises and composes, you know, bipartite dance forms and figuration preludes and, you know, things on themes like he totally knows what he's doing. And he started this in retirement. Wow. So that gives me a lot of hope of, of what people could do. Now, I think he spends all day. I think he's pretty committed. Sure. Well, <laughs> yeah. Well, but, and I'm sure uh, you're very committed as well, though. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what, what would you say? Um, what, there's a lot of interesting things to unpack here, um, and actually, you know, I'm thinking maybe do you want do you want to show the video now of of your yeah. performance? I mean, sure. Well, let's hear some music. So, um, uh, do, do you want to do a little introduction for what the audience is about to hear, uh, John? Is this the one from Aarhus? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. This is this is from Denmark. This is from a couple of years ago. Uh, almost immediately before the world fell apart with uh, COVID, I was in the UK and Denmark on some touring. And this is from the Symphonic Hall at the Royal Danish Conservatory in Aarhus. Uh, I got in there in the morning to rehearse and they it was this great, really spectacular Hamburg D, just, you know, perfect. 
in this spectacular huge auditorium. So the, the resonance was, was quite striking. And I thought, well, I mean, I have to improvise something that takes advantage, something with big chords and then pauses. And so this was the opener for the concert that night.
Okay. So thank you so much for this performance, John. Uh, th th this was you know really fantastic. Everyone in the in the chat is just very excited with with how beautiful and amazing it sounds. Um, amazing, wow, wonderful. Um, so I, I know you can't see the chat right now, but it's it, it's really. Uh, so many so many interesting comments, me mesmerizing and more. So I actually I've never heard this piece before, and um, I, I I don't know the composer actually Ar Arhus at all. So uh, how much other music ha has been written? Um, for, for, you know, for so so can you tell us a little bit more about this this exact piece? And so you're improvising um, aspects to it. Um, no, the whole thing's improvised. The whole thing. Oh, the whole thing yeah. is improvised. And yeah. Ar Arhus, is, is that a composer? Is, is that the place? Ar Arhus is a city. Uh, a city. Got it. Got it. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, this is the conservatory in Arhus, the Royal Danish mm -hmm. Conservatory. Uh, Arhus is, is the kind of the second city mm -hmm. after Copenhagen mm -hmm. um, in Jutland, in, in the kind of main big peninsula area. Mm -hmm. uh, very beautiful, lovely city, by the way. Charming city. Amazing. Uh, a lot of wonderful people there. Um, yeah, the, the, whole, the whole thing is improvised. I never played it before oh, and have not ever played it again. No, no, it's just a one time. Wow, um, amazing. So thank you very wow. much. I'm glad people enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people are you know, wanting to play this, but it's not written down, <laughs> right? It's only in your head. Okay, so. uh, I, I will say I, I did make a transcription of it oh. because I, w I got some requests. Um, if I remember correctly, I don't really do much with this, but it might be on my website. Uh, in like oh. a shop area, you might be able to download it. I've not checked on that in a while, so don't hold me to that. I almost never transcribe anything because I'm just too busy playing new things. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I haven't played it a second time. I transcribed it so if people wanted to look at it, they could. It's, it's not for me. Um, but it, it does happen in this one instance. <laughs> there is a copy of it. Wow. Um, so uh, they can check there. If it's not there, Dominic, you can hit me up and okay. I'll I can Sounds find good. a way to get it to you. Well, sounds great because I, it does seem like a lot of, lot of our audience members uh, really were affected by it. And, and let's well, see, the, the, some comments, a bit sounds like Bach at times, a bit, you know, mm -hmm. uh, someone, that's, someone was commenting that. So, and then Monica says that, I just bought a copy of the Pianist Guide to Historic Improvisation. So mm -hmm. yes, this is too great not to learn. So lots of interesting. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and I think that actually Alessandro just posted a link product of the Aarhus Concert Prelude. Um, yes, it is okay. on your website at the product. So thank you, Alessandro, for for sharing that link. So yes, your your website's up to date. Wonderful. Okay, wow. Well, I mean. It, it, it's, it's interesting to, that we were talking about improvisation in a theoretical sense, and then we hear it in practice, you know, just now, and we see really, yeah, the potential uh, for that. And I mean, so if, if someone was wanting to try to do something like this, um, and they have, you know, some proficiency with playing classical music, Bach, and Handel, Beethoven, etc. cetera, um, what, what are the first steps that you would take, or that you would talk yeah. to a student about uh, to start getting the, their mindset geared toward creating something like this. Yeah, that's, that's really important to talk about. Uh, first of all, to dispel some misconceptions, one thing that will not work is just play a lot of preludes and fugues from the Weltheimer Clavier, play a lot of inventions, just play things and memorize them from the score and you will sort of magically absorb. That will not work. And the reason it will not work is there's this thing that I like to call participation in construction. Now, when we learn music from scores, it's a very involved process, and it's a, you know, obviously most of the people who are involved in this live stream are well aware of this process, how much work it is and how serious it is. One thing that is not included in that process is truly participating in the choices that built that music. Okay, we participate in other things, articulation, and we have to do it physically, and we have to audiate, and all, all kinds of other things. But we do not participate in the actual choices of construction. What is the theme? How do you harmonize that theme? Do I ch choose this harmonization or that harmonization? Where am I modulating? How am I modulating? I don't, I don't participate in those decisions at all. I just take the dictation from the score and do it. And I might notice and I might not notice those choices, but I don't have to notice those choices. And this is evident and, and obviously true. Um, 
I'm judging a competition this weekend over in another part of the state, and I think they're very advanced high schoolers, and I'm almost sure that I'm going to hear a whole bunch of really difficult works of Chopin played probably very, very well, technically, from young people who have not really thought about how these themes came to be. Why modulate here? Why do this section now? In other words, they've not participated in construction. So that, that's just to say that you can't get this just from playing repertoire. You will not. Uh, what you have to do is start participating in the construction of music. And I, the way, the, what I use is the same as what they used in the 18th century. I use the same pedagogical methods, and most of my friends who teach this do the same. Go back to the Italian conservatories, where all this came from, and just follow the same path. So the first thing that I teach is what's called rule of the octave. And rule of the octave is a system of chords for the right hand that match ascending and descending scales in major and minor in the left hand. So that no matter what note in the bass is playing, I have something correct to go with it. Okay? Uh, and therefore, I can immediately harmonize any bass line with something that will sound adequate. I could play from an unfigured bass line. I could accompany a restative or anything like that, um, just knowing rule of the octave. Uh, it's quite involved, and I require my students to learn it in all 24 keys in every position of the right hand, ascending, descending, major, minor, and then there's some exceptions with certain leaps that they have to know. What rule of the octave is, it's a default basic harmonic language that allows you to speak the language of music at will spontaneously. So for example, I'll just play rule of the octave. If I want to harmonize that bass line, on the way down, minor, And you hear it's just very ordinary sounding, very classical, ordinary, unremarkable sound. And that's because classical music has been relying on this as its kind of basic language for hundreds of years. This is the small talk of music. If you just want to say hello, good morning, nice to meet you, welcome to my sonata, you use rule of the octave to do that. Uh, and it starts to introduce you to the idea that you can know and understand everything that happens harmonically. So that's, that's the first step, is, is RO, we call it RO. Uh, and it, it's so pretty involved to really get it. Um, some of the things you have to overcome, uh, you have to forget about Roman numerals for a while, and you have to forget about contemporary chord symbols for a while, and just do this other thing. And then once they have RO, you can start to do other things like partimento and non-harmonic tones and, and start to expand the language. But that's where it all starts, is rule of the octave. So everybody who comes to me and says, I want to improvise, first question I ask is, how's your RO? And if they don't know it, I send them off to go, <laughs> to <laughs> go learn it. <laughs> I yeah, see. Yeah. Good to mm -hmm. know. Good to know. Rule of the octave, everybody. That's, mm -hmm. that's great. Well, so... so Rule of the octaves. So, so mastering that or, or getting some proficiency with that. Would you say that that you know takes you know um, months? Does it take uh, years? Or uh, what, what kind of average you know learning time do you see see with uh, your students? Just, just out of curiosity. Oh, it varies completely with their background. Mm -hmm. uh, some people struggle with it mightily. Uh, maybe because, uh, you know, if, if it depends on the keyboard facility they have. If they're also just trying to get their fingers to obey, that's an added layer that's going to slow it down for sure. Um, undergrads or grads who have already had some early music training will look at it and go, oh, yeah, I already have to know what this is and dive right into it. Um, Jazz players are usually pretty quick, except they want to use chord symbols for everything, which slows it down. It's actually inefficient and slows it down. And theorists want to use Roman numerals, which drags it down. You cannot improvise from Roman numerals. It doesn't work. 
Got it. Um, and that's why they didn't, well, they weren't invented in the 18th century, for one thing. Um, but they didn't need them because they had other methods that were far more efficient to understand what's going on harmonically. This is really interesting. I, I think this is the first time I've ever heard someone talk about improvisation and say that Roman numerals will not help you. Yeah, that, 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 that's kind of revolutionary, at least to, to my ears. So, uh, fascinating. Um, and, and actually, to follow quickly up on that, I do see that, that an, an anonymous uh, user is asking, and I wonder if jazz piano study studying affects your classical piano negatively at all, or would jazz piano affect mm. improvisation negatively, or, or is it just good to have? Do you have any thoughts on, on that question? I, I don't think in and of itself studying one thing hurts another thing. Um, anything that makes you smarter is good. Uh, maybe if you don't have time for them all and you spend all your time here and you can't work there, okay. That's just, you have to make choices in life. But no, um, every kind of music will reflect some kind of light on other kinds of music, even if just by being totally different and having nothing to do with the other kind of music. It will, it will set that in relief and make you see both styles more clearly. So I'm very much in favor of it. And, um, you know, I love rock and roll and metal and jazz and blues and choral music and medieval music and all of that and I'm very fascinated at how they they relate to each other so no I, I wouldn't I wouldn't worry about hurting the purity of your classical breeding <laughs> by <laughs> getting involved I don't I don't think that really is the case no <laughs> well that, that, that's good to know because uh, we all we all love jazz here on, on tone bass and we need to For get sure. more of it too um, so let, let me see here. Um, there, there's a comment uh, from Michelle about CP, CPE box art of keyboard playing. Um, mm -hmm. Michelle says that my son's been working on this and he's going through all the exercises. It, w w would yeah. this be um, you know helpful material for, for, for this improvisation? I mean, are there specific exercises that a person could open a book up and, or is it just um, you know a, a figured base that we should be that we should be working on? Um, to, uh, yeah, like, is there anything yeah. that you could just, oh, I mean, well, you also have a book, though. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Is that okay. Does that kind of open the door to that? Um, first of all, CPE Bach, mm -hmm. um, if, if you're doing CPE Bach in a vacuum without other things to support it, and you're not already kind of a scholar and kind of know where he's coming from and why he says the stuff he says, I think it would be fairly difficult um, to, to follow what he's talking about. Um, once you understand that century and that history more, you start to go, oh, I see what he's doing. But I think if it's the only thing you're working on and, and you're a little bit more of an amateur, I think it could be frustrating. Um, I'm going through CPE book for some of my students now working on embellishments and his chapter on improvisation. And there's a, a great deal that's valuable there, but I think for modern people without other forms of support and resources, it might not be the best starting point. Um, that's largely why I wrote Pianist Guide, was to take players who, you know, they're comfortable at the keyboard, they can play, they've played literature, they maybe have been to school, um, they're either advanced amateurs or they're, you know, conservatory students or professionals, and then take the knowledge they have and start them down the road to being able to improvise. So it tries to take where the modern player is and, and then move them through explaining one thing at a time. Now, the first thing that happened when I wrote it and sent it away for editorial reviews is they said it was paced too fast. It was way too hard. And I had to stretch it out and slow it down. I, I did. I doubled the length of it and everything, you know, more exercises. Well, I was recently at a funeral and two of my aunts were there. They're very musical people. And they both told me they bought the book and they stopped after about a page. <laughs> so, uh, oh my. I, I, was, I was happy with their honesty, I guess, but um, did realize that you need, a, you know, you need a certain baseline level of musical awareness just to even start the book. So my poor aunts were not able to do it. But I think most undergrads could. Mm -hmm. Mo I, I think the level of the tone base clientele, probably from what I understand, you'd be okay. Um, and, and so what I was trying to achieve was how do you get somebody going improvising who has not read all these treatises of C.P.E. Bach and Heineken and 
Feneroli and Durante and blah, 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 blah. Uh, they just, they know how to play. They play a couple sonatas. And what do they need? So that's, that's really more what that book is, um, to be accessible to the modern person. Got it. Thank you for that. Um, and Douglas has a question about, do ideas come to you in classical improvisations in much the same way as in jazz improvisations? Um, do, do you find it that, that these little earworms or these little motifs come to you in a very similar way? Or are you yeah. thinking about different aspects of um, classical? I, I, th I think so. I think so. You know, we, we all, whether in jazz or classical, you know, we all experience these flow states sometimes. We're just, for some reason, just everything you do seems great and magic. Mm -hmm. Other times, you just kind of fall back on your tried and true stuff because nothing new seems to spring up. So you hope you have a good library ready to go of, of used ideas. Uh, so I think that is quite similar. The real difference between classical, you know, this, especially Baroque, is the voice leading restrictions, where in jazz you have all kinds of unprepared dissonances that are not considered dissonant even. You know, sharp 11, you just plop it in out of nowhere and it's legal. Whereas you're always preparing dissonance in advance. So you're working within a tighter set of restrictions in historical improvisation. Uh, but I do think that sometimes the feel of discovery and freedom is, is probably about the same on a good day, I hope. Got it. Well, thank you for that. Um, and so there's a few things that I want to um, bring up now that you sent me this wonderful document that I'm going to put on the screen about what's happening in improvisation. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if maybe I'm going to put this list on the screen so we can see. And maybe you can talk a little bit about these different, you know, conferences and and different you know projects and different things that are going on yeah. because because you've got a lot of stuff so let me let me put this up and and maybe um maybe you can talk about it so uh let's see here let me get that put up um in just a second um let's see here um should be right over here um, yes so i'm just gonna quickly just one second everyone get this and I'll ask you a few little questions about about what what so for example you have your website right uh, but you did mention that um, perhaps you haven't um, looked at it recently is, is that right or oh no just that that shop area I haven't I haven't checked on that uh, the, the rest of it's fairly up-to-date mm -hmm. I get around and with a broom and a set of pruners on a regular basis. I hope. Okay, got it. Um, and there is more uh, as far as resources. I, I didn't include everything because you know we were time limited in our conversation today. Yes. But on the website, there's a section called Improvisation Resources, mm -hmm. where especially I'm linking to other people's books mm -hmm. and websites. Uh, I have a lot of colleagues who are involved and who have excellent stuff to offer, and uh, so I wanted to point some attention to them. So that that is on the website as mm -hmm. well. Great, and um, you have a few other um, books that are that are written down. You have Improvising Fugue, a method for keyboard artists. You have mm -hmm. The Pianist Guide to Hist Historic Improvisation. You mm -hmm. also have Improvisation in Historical Styles, Performance, Pedagogy, and Research. Can you talk a little bit about those three books and perhaps you know how they compare yeah. and relate? Pianist Guide is the first one, and it's it's um, we we already discussed it a little bit. It's um, going from nothing. Just, just accept having some familiarity and, and being an adequate pianist and knowing you know, how music sounds and having played some, how do you get into improvisation? So it starts with very simple exercises, figuration, preludes, consonants, dissonance patterns, building up pieces kind of with little building blocks and moving into more challenging areas, larger forms. Um, but it's, it's meant to be introductory to to the advanced amateur or the you know this conservatory student or the professional uh, i've been very gratified by its reception they use it at juilliard they use it at mcgill they use it all over the world in in the big conservatories um, the newest one which is not out yet is improvising fugue and this is a, this is more advanced um, the first half is a complete course on partimento which is the italian musicianship system of learning Bass lines, harmony, voice leading, imitation, counterpoint, 
uh, all that stuff. Uh, it's quite rigorous and long. And the second half is actually how to improvise fugue. Uh, so that will be out in January. It is now, I think it is for sale. In fact, I think it hit number one on Amazon earlier this month. Wow, congratulations. The top, the top thank you, the top uh, in music books. Wow. Um, not in all books, for sure. Um, I'm sure the phone would have rung if that happened. Sure. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, improvising fugue is, is coming soon. Uh, the next thing you mentioned, the improvisation in historical styles. This is a conference. It's an online conference in November. We already have all the submissions in and kind of set, so we're, we're building the website. The good news is this is free and it's accessible to everybody in the world once we get it up. Uh, so we will have presentations on, uh, there's, there's keyboard obviously, but there's also instrumental and vocal improvisation. Uh, a lot of stuff on pedagogy, the teaching of improvisation, and some research as well. Uh, I'm very, very happy my board includes what I, who the people I consider the luminaries in the field, uh, a number of them, but including Giorgio Sanguinetti, author of The Art of Partimento, Peter Van Tour, scholar from uh, Sweden, um, Kevin Corson from the University of Michigan, Yi Heng Yang from Juilliard, uh, Nicola Canzano from New York City, uh, just, just a fantastic group of, of scholars and artists who have helped me put this together. Uh, I, I think these are the top people. They really are. So if you want to attend this, you go to my website and you sign up for the newsletter on the home page and you'll get automatically get the information and it will be free November 19th and 20th. That's right, that's right, beautiful. Uh, so Improv Planet News is, is, your, uh, is your newsletter, that's the name of it, right? Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah. And, and then I see a few other things that you mentioned. Um, I don't know if yep. these are upcoming or if these are past. The Vienna Conference on Partimento, the University of uh, Perugia Conference on Improvisation. Yeah. Are, are those past events or are those, no. are those coming up? Uh, Mar those are in uh, the spring, March and April. Okay. Um, the Vienna Vienna um, University of Perf uh, Music and Performing Arts in Vienna, which is the leading music school in Austria, is is doing a conference on Partimento and its applicability, its practical applications today. One of which is improvisation. So I'll be there in person. Uh, from what I understand, doing master classes and workshops, and I, I think they're just gonna like ring me out like a dish rag and get as much out of me as they can while I'm there. Um, so it sounds like, so that'll be fun. And the one in Perugia, I don't even know if that one's been announced yet. I might be telling tales out of school, but um, there is a conference at okay. University of Perugia in Italy in, I think that one's in April. Okay, got it. And then um, are, are you participating in a Fulbright project as well? Is that something I right. see as well in a Canadian tour? Yeah, I'm leaving Monday for Montreal and we'll be at McGill, Schulich School of Music, teaching for a month, doing some doctoral colloquia, master classes, concerts, and then I'll be also at University of Ottawa, uh, L'Université du Québec à Montréal, and University of Montreal. Wow. For that month, yeah. Incredible, so, incredible. Gotta pack my bags, <laughs> yeah. That, that sounds really exciting. I know we have some of our members out in Canada, so perhaps if, mm -hmm. if you guys wanna go see John, say hello, go, go try to learn from him, uh, definitely keep keep posted for that or you know uh, keep an eye out for him that, that that's incredible um, so as we're you know get, getting to the top of the hour I'm wondering if we can maybe move to um, you, you had sent me some some figured base um, yeah a, a page of figured base and I was wondering if we could maybe take a, a look at that for for the remainder of our time sure. and take a look at I'm gonna put that on our screen and take a look at you know maybe you playing it, uh, you showing what its potential is because in just a second I'm gonna put this um, this score on the screen and just quickly uh, resize that. Um, but the idea though is that to a lot of us this kind of looks almost like um, something very very alien, you know, mm -hmm. I, you know, I know. Like how we make sense of it and. Um, yeah. And more. So, um, so let so let's see. Uh, c can you talk to us a little bit about about this? Because I, I see you know lots of numbers, and I must admit that I'm not the most equipped figured base uh, reader uh, my, myself. So, um, yeah, do you have the score yourself, or are you? I do. I, what, yeah, what, I got it in front of me okay. right here, so oh, oh, we yeah, can nice. we can chat. Yeah, very good. Uh, 
So, you know, they don't really teach figured base very much except as a kind of passive uh, analytical tool in theory class. It's a, it's a paperwork thing. So for most people who've studied music, it's not an active part of what they do when they get to the instrument. And so, yes, the word you used was alien, and I think you're, you're right. It is very alien for most people. Um, in order to do uh, improvisation in historical styles, you really do have to reckon with figured bass. It is their language. It's the language of the people who invented all this music. And, and it doesn't really help to substitute some other analytical system from our modern day. You just, just use the same tools even though it's a little bit painful at first. So the first example at the top left, uh, what, what CPE has done here, these are from CPE Bach, is he's given two versions where there's numbers above and below. They're no, those are not to be played at the same time. When there's a version below, that's an alternate. So you're not reading both of those, so don't be scared. Um, so if I only read the numbers above, that is standard rule of the octave. And so what's going on there, if I put nothing, then that is a triad. It's what we call a chord of the fifth. If I put a six, then you give it a third and a sixth. Um, and, and, and so on, all the way up. Six, five, it takes a sixth and a fifth. Um, you usually assume the third. And so that's just the basic rule of the octave. But I want to play you the second one uh, so you can hear this with all these nines and eights and sevens and sixes and what in the world is going on here. Okay? This is rooted in very old practices of how you can harmonize an ascending scale. And so if I start on C, and then I just assume a fifth and an and octave and a third, just a triad, this is fine. And then I go to the second note, the D, it says nine, seven, okay? Now nines and sevens are dissonances. I have to know that. And I have to know that those have to be prepared by common tone. So over the D, what is a ninth and a seventh? Well, that's a C and an E. And I started my first chord with those. And so I get that. And then I see I resolve those to eight and six. And now the other missing piece of the puzzle is if I play a, a third with the bass. And then these beautiful sounds up here. Here's the, here's the, uh, the E and the C, and now the bass move, and its little tenth friend move up. You get that sound, and that's going to resolve, and then it's going to jump. And then I might do something like that. And you hear this gorgeous sound, like, oh my goodness. Now what's cool about it is all of those upper voices are invertible, so I don't have to start here with the C and the E, I can invert to here. Okay, and now I take my 10th. So my top voices have traded places, and here's the old version. And I can even mix them up further. I can put my, my third in the middle of all that mess and play like this. Now that's gorgeous stuff, okay? And that's just a little exercise from CPE Bach. Wow. So what, what do we get from this? <clears throat> when you study all of these, you get all of the standard ways that composers of C.P. Bach's day or the Italian school or the German school, all of the standard ways they would approach an ascending scale in the bass. All of them. Now, sometimes they'd invent a little weird hybrid one uh, and there's a quirky one, but these are all the basic ones. And so, one... I know all the options they would have come to the table with, and I can choose from those as I'm making music. So I'm using the same tools that they used. Two, I'm learning counterpoint because I'm flipping those voices around and putting them in a different order and checking out, ooh, listen to the colors, it's really, really cool. Three, my audiation goes through the roof 
Because once I have played all of these standard moves and studied them and got them in my hands, I hear them in the literature all the time. Okay? All the time. We almost play a game in the improv community. You know, somebody plays a piece by Scarlatti or Handel or whatever, and we're like, oh, that part's Rule of the Octave. Oh, that's Romanesca. That's a 5 6. That's a Monte. That's a Fonte. That's a whatever. It, like, just see if everybody knows all the moves. It's kind of a little show offy game. Wow. So that's what's going on. That's what you get from the agony of working with figured bass. And again, just to circle around, where I would start is back with RO. Because you have the same figured bass in every major and minor key, the same patterns, and you get really, really good at them. Seeing the six fives and the sixes and the four twos, you just get to know what those are and they become friends. So I, I wouldn't actually start with this, mm -hmm. with CPE's scales, because they're crazy. Uh, I, I would start with, with Rule of the Octave and just get to know that. Got it. Okay, by the way, this morning, this morning I was hearing a student playing um, Papillon by Schumann, Opus 2, and was stumbling through, having a little bit of trouble somewhere, uh, just remembering something, and I said, look, the, the first five measures of this whole section is Rule of the Octave. Schumann is using Rule of the Octave. Of course he is. There's a Chopin waltz where the entire A section is nothing but Rule of the Octave. And when you know your RO, first of all, you recognize it. Second of all, you have three or four pages of Chopin memorized instantly. Because you don't have to go back and remember those individual notes. You know the whole pattern. So that's really what's involved and, uh, and what the benefits are. That's fascinating because this is another um, this is another way to, to memorize music, which is something that a lot of our uh, users members are always asking about. Because memory can be a, a scary thing and a, and a difficult yeah. thing to grasp. Because there's of course knowing your Roman numerals and knowing kind of how that works, and then there's this added dimension, which it, I must say is, is lacking and almost everybody, uh, myself included. So, um, you know, I, I mean, and also, I don't know about you guys, but I was transfixed by just that simple scale, how you were voicing that and hearing just that C major scale in a completely different light. It, it, it mm -hmm. makes you want to, it, it, it almost makes you learn and see C major in a more intense way with, with yeah. all of these. So th th that's, that's really, really amazing stuff. And, um, about this briefly, Roy has a question. When the voices are being flipped, like inverted, like you just did, uh, he's asking the bass stays uh, in the situation. The, ba the bass stays the same, right? Yes. I, mean, I mean, yeah, so the bass, yeah. Roy, will never never change. Uh, the, when it's written, right. the bass is, is king, so to speak, paramount. It, it yeah. doesn't, um, it's the other things that you color and, 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 and yeah. I, I agree, Rui, that we all have to start paying attention to this now. Uh, mm -hmm. Another comment from, from one of our, um, our viewers. But uh, wow, well, thank you. So, so RO, I, I'm going to start thinking more and more about the role of the octave now, because that that does seem like a, a game changer, truly, for for us. And it's and it's it, you know, we'll be wrapping up it, it, it you know shortly. But it does seem really um, enticing that you were just talking about Schumann, Chopin, composers that we all know mm -hmm. and love. I mean, yeah. Uh, a lot of us do love C.P. Bach, but maybe he's not the first composer that we think of when we want to play a piece of music. But Chopin, using Rule of the Octave, that's um, that, mm -hmm. that, that, that's really interesting because he 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 probably is, is hiding it. Well, for you, it's very apparent, but for most audiences, they're probably hearing Rule of the Octave all the time and have no idea that it's it's there. Do you think Chopin knew that he was using Rule of the Octave or? or what was um. I, well, n not maybe not under that name because okay. it went it went by different names I, I, in the Italian school. This was just known as Scala, the scale, and um, is the first scale. The the one we call Rule of the Octave was the first version that they would learn, and then they would learn a lot of other ways of harmonizing it, like this one with the ninths that I showed you. Um, Chopin got some version of this as well. Um, there's a lot of research going on right now, like what version got transmitted to what countries at what time. Basically, uh, a lot of the Italian stuff was taken into the rest of Europe, especially with the Paris Conservatory. The, the Paris Conservatory took the entire Italian pedagogical tradition and picked it up and plopped it down in Paris and started to morph it. So, um, but Chopin was trained in Warsaw and there's a lot of evidence that 
he had similar training. Hmm. Wow. Well, 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 thank you so much for that. Um, I, I think we will um, be, be wrapping things up shortly here. I, I do see that Alessandro mentions a, a, a few names of, of other great Partimento realization players like Nicoletta Parashivesca, yep. Ewald mm-hmm. Demere. I'm sorry. Ewald Demere, for, yeah. To pronounce mm-hmm. these names poorly. but And then mm-hmm. Bart Jacobs did something, I think, um, of BWV 907. Um, interesting. Thank, thank you for, uh-huh. for sharing some of these uh these performers and and I agree. Um, so so on, on Tone Base we have you know these monthly community challenges and different things and and at a future point doing a rule of the octave challenge would be very interesting <laughs> to have you know two weeks where everyone is is improvising submitting videos of rule of the octave trying their best to practice that. So um, th- th- you know I, I agree that a lot of people Monica is saying this is really enlightening. I feel like John has opened up a whole new world to me and I I am totally on board with you monica i totally agree so john uh, any parting words before we leave you um I, I, there was one question about university of ottawa if you're going are you going to university of ottawa grace was yeah. asking okay next week next week well grace mm-hmm. you're out in ottawa so uh maybe try to try to see if john's around <laughs> so um that's that, that's what uh grace has asked but any last parting words that you have for us before we uh let you go yeah i, I just if you're interested in this stuff d- don't be dismayed it's a lifelong thing it's a lifelong thing and every step takes work and reinforcement and you know just be patient and stay at it um, because you will never finish (laughs) you'll never be done Um, and uh, but I I do encourage people to check it out Uh, the people I communicate with my students and so on have really found a lot of joy in their own journey in improvisation Um, learning it playing it sharing it with others of course and um, so I encourage people to check it out if they're interested. And my last question is, what's next for you besides all of your projects and, and, and your, your touring? But for example, we listened to your fantastic you know, video earlier. And for a lot of us, we're like, well, that's it. I mean, what else do you want to do? <laughs> but, but I'm sure you have other uh, things that you're fascinated in with the yeah. improvisation and more. So, so that video aside, what's, what's next for John in a very like artistic sense? Like, what, what, what are you looking mm-hmm. at, at, at next sort of? Sonatas. Sonatas. Yeah. Uh, I, I've not published anything and, and haven't released anything publicly, but I'm doing this in concert where I'll do sonata movements on themes of so-and-so. Usually they're lesser known because if you use a famous Mozart theme, your mind just goes to that sonata. Sure. So I use unknown people, you know, John Baptist Kramer, um, Josef Würfel, Emily Mayer, um, Anton Eberl, just kind of lesser known. So, th- so when you hear the theme, you don't know the sonata. And I don't know their sonatas that well, so I don't start imitating them too much. But the themes are really stylistically great, so you get a first and second theme, and maybe look a little at their figuration and their general approach, and then from there you improvise a whole sonata structure. Wow. Uh, which is a little bit more involved than just overture, prelude, toccata kind of stuff. Yeah, a little bit yeah. more. Um, and so I'm trying to find out what are the problems. Um, is there a pedagogy of this? You know, is there an approach? I did a class on 19th century preluding, uh, which is online. Um, so, you know, I felt like I could get that in a concise course and explain it. I'm trying to see if Sonata can, can be done in the same way. Uh, and then next up would be romantic character pieces. Fascinating. Wow. Well, we can't wait to be uh, following your journey <laughs> uh, because you, you've got a lot of fans and new fans after today, of course. Well, thank so you um, I, and a number of people are saying, I hope you go to the Ottawa event. So it seems like we've got some Ottawa uh, viewers today. Um, well, yeah, right. go check, Canadians. Go, yeah, that's right. <laughs> go check out John and uh, also check out again all of his lessons on Tone Base. So thanks, everyone, for joining today. Uh, We'll see you guys uh, next week with some exciting uh, streams. But but John, cheers, and uh, good luck on on, on your tour and everything coming up. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks, Dominic.